Hello. Chapter 3 is about observing microorganisms through a microscope. So in this chapter, we're going to learn what are the units of measure to measure microorganisms, what are some of the equivalents of these measurement units, and also we're going to see principles of microscopy, including the types of microscopes, the parts of the light or compound microscope, and we're going to see what is total magnification and resolution, and we're going to see what are the uses of those specific types of microscopes. <clears throat> so this is a table showing you the metric units and the equivalents of uh, the imperial system. So <clears throat> one kilometer equals 1,000 meters. And it is the same as 32,080.84 feet or 0.62 miles. Now, one meter, which is one tenth of one kilometer, it is the standard unit of length that is used in the metric system, and it is the equivalent of 1.09 yards. A tenth of a meter is a decimeter, and this it is the equivalent to 3.94 inches. One centimeter is one hundredth of a meter, and it is the equivalent of two point, sorry, point three ninety four inches. <clears throat> and one inch equals to two point fifty four centimeters. One thousand of a meter. It is one millimeter. And this doesn't have the equivalent here. And from now on, all these units uh, lower than one millimeter doesn't have an equivalent in the US system. <clears throat> so then one millimeter, it is one tenth of a meter. And it is the same as expressing as 0 0.001 meters which equals to 10 to the minus three meters. One micrometer equals to one millionth of a meter or 10 to the minus six meters or 0 0.00001 meters. Now I'm not going to keep saying the, the rest of the point zeros, but know that basically the unit in here, it is added at the end after to five, uh, five training zeros. <clears throat> now, one nanometer equals to one billionth of a meter, and it's 10 to the minus nine meters. And then we have this super small unit, which is a picometer, which is basically 10 to the 12 meters, 10 to the minus 12 meters, and si similar for all of these units. Anything <clears throat> that it is, uh, smaller than a meter you put it like 10 to the minus one for decimeters 10 to the minus two for centimeters 10 to the minus three for millimeters 10 to the minus six for micrometers 10 to the minus nine for nanometers and 10 to the minus 12 for uh, picometers mm. now these units are important for us because it allow us to measure these different organisms or structures that are found within the cells. So <clears throat> if you look in here, we have a scale that tells you that we have a unit. And this unit will be, as we said, taken from meters. And in here, we have the lowest unit that we said that it was the picometers. So next to this scale, we have this range of the unit, that it is what we can see either with the innate eye, so anything greater than 200 micrometers, or with the aid of a light microscope in this bar with LM, and a scanning electron microscope with SEM in this range, and then for transmission electron microscope up to this range, and atomic force microscope as to, up to this range. So a thick, it can be seen with the innate eye. 
and this is because it's greater than 200 micrometers in its uh, size. Now, for red blood cells, which are the cells of the blood that carries oxygen and CO2, these ones are small. They measure uh, kind of side to side, and, and you can see this bar scale in here, up to 5 micrometers. So these ones cannot be seen with the uh, without the aid of a microscope. So you need to use one of these microscopes that is capable of looking at this unit or well this size. So here we have light microscope that it can see between 200 nanometers and 10 millimeters. So this can be seen with this type of microscope or the red blood cells also can be seen with the scan electron microscope, which can be uh, used to see some, uh, items that are between 10 nanometers to 1 millimeter. Transmission electron microscope, it is very powerful. You can see very tiny, small things like from 10 picometers to 100 micrometers. And then atomic microscope, atomic force microscope, they can see very small units between 0.1 nanometers and 10 nanometers. So DNA can be seen with atomic force microscope. These viruses that has 50 nanometers in size, which are bacteriophages or viruses that attack or destroy bacteria, they can be seen with transmission electron microscope. And bacteria such as E. coli, it can be seen with great detail with a scanning electron microscope. And the length of these bacteria is 2 mic micrometers. Now, bacteria not only can be seen with the scanning electron microscope, but also with transmission electron microscope or with light microscope. And in this course, you will be learning about the bacterial world and how we can use this compound microscope to observe bacteria. <clears throat> so here are some of the units of measurement then that we use specifically to measure bacteria or microorganisms. So microorganisms are measured in micrometers, and this is the notation, the mu letter from the Greek alphabet and M for the abbreviation of the meters, so micrometers. And these, again, micrometers are one millionth of a meter, so it's 10 to the minus 6 meters, and we have this equivalent for micrometers, nanometers. So <clears throat> these nanometers are 1,000 on, in one micrometer. So one micrometer has 10,000 nanometers or one nanometer is 0 0.001 micrometers. So here we have then the equivalents. One micrometer is one millionth of a meter, or it is 1,000 of a millimeter. So it's 10 to the minus three millimeters. And then one nanometer, it is one billionth of a meter, or is one millionth of a millimeter. So, 1,000, again, 1,000 nanometers equals one micrometer, or one micrometer equals 0 0.001 micrometers. And here we have a bacteria that is called H. pylori, that it can be seen within this scanning electron micrograph, and you can measure then not only the length of the bacteria, which is this, but some appendages or accessories that the bacteria has with these units. So this is called flagella. So you can measure them then with these uh, units of measurement. So as I mentioned before, we need to have microscopes to aid us to see these small microorganisms. And we have two types of microscopes. A simple microscope that has one, one lens only, just like as the replica from uh, Antoine van Leeuwenhoek, one of the discoverers of the microscope. So this is a single lens, like for instance, your uh, glasses will be a simple microscope. 
In compact microscope, it is that type of microscope that uses more than one lens to amplify the images a little bit more. So we have then within these compound microscopes different types. Some that they use light in order to make these specimens be visible, and these will be called light microscopes. And we have different types. So we have compound light microscope, the most commonly used in the beginning biology classes. We have dark field microscopes, phase contrast microscopes, differential interference microscopes, fluorescence microscopes, and confocal microscopes. So we will see the characteristics of each of these. Compound light microscopes, they have mechanical parts and optical parts. The optical parts are the ocular lens, the condenser lens, and the objective lenses, which are these. The mechanical parts will be the rest. So we have here body, the body or tube, and then we have the arm, we have the base, and we have different devices attached to these major parts that allow us to control the focusing of the specimen that you will be looking at. So here on the top of the microscope, we have one of the pieces of the optical system or the lenses. So this is the ocular lens. This one magnifies the image 10 times, most of the times. And this ocular lens is attached to this eyepiece. And this eyepiece, it is attached to the body tube. And this body tube will be the one that transmits the image from these lenses here that are attached to this nose piece. And these lenses are known as objective lenses. So these will be the main lenses that gathers the light and transmit it then into the body tube and then into the ocular lens. So you can put your eyes through here and you can see at the image. <clears throat> now the arm has attached these two focusing knobs. So we have this large knob that is called coarse focusing knob that moves this plate that we know as a stage. This plate holds the specimen that is found in a glass light, and this glass light is clipped by these stage clips. So with this coarse focusing knob, you can move in greater distance this stage up and down. And then next to this coarse focusing knob, you have this fine focusing knob that moves this stage but a smaller distances. So with this large or coarse no focusing knob, you can have gross movement of this stage so to you be able to see the image without having fine focus. And then with this fine focus, you just tune in and uh, put your image in a better position so you can see it better with better sharpness and resolution. And then just lower to this stage, we have these little knobs that allows you to move the stage to the sides and up and down, and sorry, to the sides and and then front and back. So you can put your specimen in alignment to these objective lenses. The objective lenses are of several sizes and they can magnify at different sizes the image. Now below the stage we have the condenser lens that helps to gather the light and put it into the glass light and then directed into this objective lens. And below this condenser lens, we have a control that is known as diaphragm that allows you to reduce or increase the amount of light that passes through the condenser so that you can see better with better sharpness and contrast your image. Now at the base, we have this illuminator or lamp that allows you to pass the light that comes from a light bulb that is inside this base through the condenser and then through the specimen and then through the <coughs> objective lenses. Now here on one side of the base, we have this knob that allows you to control how much light passes through the bulb and then into the 
illuminator. And the on and off switch will be here on one side. So, in a compound microscope, your image will be magnified first by the objective lens and then second by your ocular lens. And the total magnification that you can obtain with a compound light microscope is 1,000 times, and it is obtained by multiplying the magnification of your objective lens times the magnification of your ocular lens. And once you magnify your image and you focus it, you're supposed to be able to distinguish the image with sharpness. And this term resolution, it tells you the following, that it is the ability of the lenses in your microscope to be able to distinguish two separate points. And the microscopes typically have a resolving power of 0.4 nanometers that it allows you to distinguish between two points that are greater or equal of 0.4 nanometers apart. And when you have shorter wavelengths passing through these specimen and these objective lenses as it travels into the ocular lenses, you will have greater resolution with shorter wavelengths. So this is a path that the light follows through these microscopes. So you have here the source of, illumina of, of uh, illumination at the base, and the light bulb, once it is passing these electrons to the filaments, it will allow the light to go through this illuminator and then into these condenser lenses, into the specimens, and then into the objective lenses. And from the objective lenses inside the body tube, you have a prism that helps to reflect the light towards the ocular lens and then towards your eye. In light microscopy, we deal with something that is called refractive index, which is the measurement of how much the light bends through as it's passing through a medium. So the light as it's passing through the medium can be either going directly into the objective lens or it can go sideways. So this will be the refraction of the light. Now, the more light that it is bent away from the objective lens, it will be lost in the air and then you will have less resolution. In order to prevent this from happening, you will use immersion oil that keeps the light from bending. So this is what happens then. So here's your condenser lenses underneath the stage. So the stage, it will be holding your glass light. And as the light is passing through these condenser lenses, the condenser lenses will try to put it in a cone in the central area on your glass light. And then after the light hits the glass light, the light can follow two pathways, either go directly into the objective lenses or bend away. And when you have air in between your objective lens, which is this, and your glass light, the light will tend to go away from following a direct pathway. And this is known as refraction. So in order for the light to be prevented from refracting, you will use immersion oil that will help to keep the light in its path. And this immersion oil will have the same density or refractive index as your glass light. So that's why you will try to correct this refraction and allow to gather more light so you can see better. So that's for light microscopy. You also have the principles. So you have different types of microscopes. So you have bright field in which the object will appear dark and the, you, you will have around the object a bright background. And the light reflector of the specimen will not enter the objective lens. That's why you see bright around the specimen. 
You can have another type of microscope that is called phase contrast in which the light objects will be visible against a dark background. So it's the opposite of bright field. And the light will be reflected of the specimen entering into the objective lens. It is <clears throat> different from bright field. In bright field, the light that is reflected from the specimen doesn't enter in the objective lens, while in phase contrast is the opposite. And then for dark field, dark field will be seeing light objects against a dark background similar to phase contrast. But in this case, the light reflected from the specimen will be entering the objective lens. And this light will be important then to see this dark field. So this is how then the light travels through the different types of microscopes and how they produce different objects uh, or well, different view of the objects. So in here we have the illuminator passing in the light microscope or bright field, passing the light through this condenser lens, and then it hits this specimen, then it will be collected from the objective lens and going into the ocular and then to the eyes. So all of this light that it is gathered is going to make this specimen to look dark against a light or bright field background. In this type of microscope, which is <clears throat> this dark field, you will have an opaque disk that will prevent the light to go directly into this specimen. And some of the light that goes on the sides of this opaque disk will be directed by this objective lens. Then you will have part of the light that is going to be unreflected and part of the light that is going to be coming into your objective lens. So all of this light that is reflected will be gathered by the specimen and then you will be seeing this dark background against this specimen that will be look like light. And then in phase contrast, you will gather both the refracted and unrefracted light with this objective lens and you will have part of these parts in the objective lens that allows you to have the undiffracted light unaltered by the specimen going into your ocular lens. So this is <clears throat> interference that it can be seen in this specimen and makes you look this specimen with greater details than with dark field. So in here you see a dark background and the specimen with greater detail. So <clears throat> then we have another type of microscope that is called phase contrast that allows you to accentuate the reflection of the light as it's passing through the specimen. So with this, because you accentuate how much light it is being diffracted, you will see in better detail of the internal structures. And then with differential interfering contrast or DIC, you will accentuate also the diffraction, but you will use two beams of light. And with DIC, you will be seeing better contrast than with phase contrast. So this is DIC. So it's the same specimen as this. This is paramecium. This is a protozoan. But see, here is light, light microscopy. This is dark field. This is phase contrast. And now look at differential interference. Which you, when you use two photons of light, you can see better the internal structures. So these are vacuoles. This is food that the uh, protozoan eat. And all of these that you see here on the sides, this will be something that is called the flagella. And this helps the protozoan to move around. Now, this is a greater magnification than these previous ones. But as you can see, changing a little bit some of the items 
within these uh, sets of lenses can help you to see better the images of these specimens. Now we have another type of microscope that is called fluorescence microscope. And in here, instead of using a normal light bulb, you use a light bulb that can emit UV light. And with this UV light, you can heat these molecules that you coat with the specimen that are known as fluorochromes. So fluorochromes will be dyes or molecules that can absorb the light of a certain wavelength, and then it will emit light at a different wavelength. And with this, you can see better contrast or better detail of these specimens. So we have um, these then fluorescent microscopy that allows you to see nice detail of the specimens. And within fluorescent microscopy, we have something as well that is called immunofluorescence, in which sometimes you don't coat the specimen with this uh, fluorescence dye, but you can add uh, into the specimen some antibodies that are tagged or marked with these fluorescent dyes. And when you shine this, you will light through these fluorescent dyes in the antibodies, you will still have emission of, of light of a different spectrum or wavelength, and then you will be allowed to see many details of these specimens. And in here we have a type of bacteria that is called triponema, that it's a spiral-like bacteria in which you cannot stain them with normal uh, techniques, so you have to use immunofluorescence to see them under the microscope, and this is how it looks. Now we have another type of microscope that is called confocal microscope. In this, you will use a photon, a single photon that will illuminate the specimen in planes, one plane at a time. And then you can get stacks of these images and you will have a depth up to 100 micrometers. And when you just call, uh, merge all these stacks and then you uh, use a computer software to generate the image, you can have a two-dimensional and sometimes up to a three-dimensional image of the cells. And this is basically the same specimen as before. This is paramecium, but you can see now the nucleus, the cytoplasm here in green color, and all of these pili or flagella around this uh, specimen. So you can see a better detail. So that's with confocal microscope. Now. <clears throat> you have a uh, two photon microscopy that uses two photons or two uh, sources of light to eliminate, sorry, to illuminate a specimen. So in this case, you will have these two photons then, and it gives you a much better detail than confocal. And similarly, it can take images at certain levels within the specimen and it can give you a depth of up to one milli my, millimeter, and this will reduce phototoxicity that is produced by these photons of light that can damage the cells. And then one advantage of this is that you can see the cells active in real time. So in this case, it's paramecium, but now you can see the vacuoles inside, food vacuoles from this specimen and you can see the transport of these vacuoles along the cytoplasm. A scanning an acoustic microscopy or SAM uses sound waves, just like as sonograms. So sound waves are being directed towards the specimen, then they are hitting certain areas within that specimen or objects, and then the sound waves are reflected back, picked up by a device, a receiver, and then the, the reflections goes into a software that is going to generate you a three-dimensional view. This type of microscope, it is used to examine living cells and how some living cells attach to another. For instance, cancer cells, or you can see plaques within the arteries or biofilms. And the resolution is very nice, up to one micrometer. Uh, and this <clears throat> is just to show you this image from a scanning acoustic microscope. In electron microscopy, 
uh, you don't use light, you use electrons. And <clears throat> the electrons, they have this powerful energy that can go and heat these objects and give you greater resolution than with light microscopy and any other type of microscope in general. So because of this, you can see images or structures that are smaller than 0.2 micrometers. And we have two types of electron microscopes. We have transmission electron microscopes or TEM, and we have scanning electron microscopes or SEM. For TEM, you will have very thin sections of the specimens. The electrons, not the light, this is wrong. The electrons will pass through the specimen and then they will, it will go into a, a magnetic lens, electromagnetic lens, and then into a screen or a film, and then into a software that is going to provide you these images after it processes the data. So in order to enhance the view of these specimens, you can coat these specimens with heavy metal salts uh, like gold or other metals, and it can give you a resolution of 2.5 nanometers. And you can have a magnification up to 100,000 times. And these transmission electron microscopes can be used to examine the structures of viruses or internal structures of the cells. So this is then how these electron microscopes look like. So they have these kind of electrons that are being sent into these areas. And these electrons will pass through this electromagnetic condenser lens that directs these electrons into the specimen. And then you have objective lenses, projector lenses, and a photographic film or a fluorescent screen. And you will be viewing the specimen through these either eyepieces or through a computer. And then you will have then these amplifiers that can allow you to see these images uh, that are so nice. So this has been the same specimen, but now our paramecium that we have been seeing before, but now with this transmission electron microscope. And see, this is the scale that we use, 20 micrometers. So this is very, very fine detail of this specimen. With the scanning electron microscope, it's the same, but in this case, the electron gun will produce the beam of electrons that will go through the surface of a whole specimen. So it will scan them. And then these electrons that are emitted from the specimen will make the image to look three-dimensional. So scanning electron micros mi microscopy gives you a better detail than transmission electron microscopy, but it has certain uses. And this can allow you to see cells, viruses that can be magnified up to 1,000 times, sorry, 10,000 times. And the resolution is 20 nanometers. So this one is still, the uh, TEM, allow you to magnify up to 100,000 times more powerfully than SEM. SEM can allow you to magnify up to 10,000 times. And this is similarly to the transmission electron microscope. But like I said, this uh, specimen will be scanned and then it will be emitting these electrons. And then you will have these electrons going into an amplifier. And then you can see this nice, beautiful three dimensional view. So this one looks fuzzy in comparison to this. So because it's showing you all of these. Uh, Lead extensions or, or peely. Now, scan probe micros microscopy has a greater resolution than transmission electron microscope, and we have different types. We have scanning tunneling microscopy, uh, sorry, microscopes or STM that will use a metal probe to go through this specimen, and it will go and reveals anything that it is inside the cell. So it will show you depressions bumps of the atoms of the surface of the specimen, and it has a resolution up to one, 100 of an atom. 
So it will be providing you details. Like in this case, this is an enzyme that is called recombinase A in bacteria. So this is a better view of the internal structures. And then we have atomic force microscopy or AFM, which is part of the scan probe microscopy that uses a metal and a diamond that inserts into the surface of the specimen and it will give you a three-dimensional view of the atoms within this specimen. So in here we have these pores of these bacteria, Clostridium perfringis, that can be seen very nicely in a three-dimensional view. Now in this part, we are going to see what are the differences between acidic and basic dyes. We're going to see how we can see better the specimens by performing stainings in them. And we're going to see the steps of different types of staining techniques like uh, gram stain technique that is highly used in the microbiology field. And we're going to see some special staining techniques like capsule staining, endospore staining, and flagellar staining. So in order for us to see better some specimens because live cells themselves are hardly seen without the aid of a phase contrast microscope. So for the most part, since we're going to be using other types of microscope, we need to stain the specimens in order to see them. And the staining uses molecules that are ions that either they have a positive charge or a negative charge. And these ions are known as chromophores. And these will enhance the specific structures within the cells. Now, in order then for us to stain the cells, we have to put them in a glass slide. And this film that we use to, to put this, the cells, well, we put the cells actually in a film uh, or a glass slide in a very thin uh, film that it is known as a smear. And the smear will contain, in the case of microbiology, microbes. And some of these microbes will be harmful for our health. So we have to heat fix these microbes to kill them, or we can use chemicals to attach or adhere these microbes to the slide and kill them. Some of these will be, uh, for instance, alcohol can be used to fix these microbes into the glass slides. And live on or on stain cells, since they have very little contrast with the medium, cannot be seen really well without the stains, but we can use these phase contrast microscopes if we want to see these live cells. So how do we prepare the smears for staining? So we will then put this film of specimens in the glass slide and then we will fix it. And after we fix it, we can add dyes. If we use a dye, it can be a basic dye for simple stains and stains where we use only one single type of dye or an acidic dye for simple stains when we use one type of dye. But sometimes we can use more than one dye in differential stainings. And in this case, we can use uh, basic dyes of different kinds or acidic dyes of a different kind. Now, basic dyes, they have a positive charge. So the chromophore, it is positively charged, so it's a cation. And since the cytoplasm of the cells, they have a negative charge, these basic, dye, basic dyes will attract into this cytoplasm and it will stain it. Now, acidic dyes, they have a negative charge, so they have uh, an ionic chromophores. And these dyes will stay outside of the cells because the inside of the cells typically is negatively charged because of the law of the opposite attracts. So then these acidic dyes will stain the background or the outside of the cells, and these will be called negative stainings. And this is more or less an illustration of how this works. So in here, we have this specimen 
attaching to this glass line. And these cells, they have these negative charges in the cytoplasm. So this is the cytoplasm, and all these will be the plasma membrane. And acidic dyes, which will be dyes that has a negative charge or a pH of 5, which is acidic, the dyes will not penetrate. They will not come into the cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm will remain colorless, and the background will be the one that stains. Now, for basic dyes with a pH greater than 8, you will have these negative charges that will be eventually all of them converted to positive because this dye will become attracted and penetrate this cell and the cells will be stained and will be seen in a colorless, colorless background. Staining techniques can be classified based on the number of stains or the specific structures that they stain into simple stain if they use a single type of dye, differential stains if they use more than one dye, and special stains if they stain parts of the cells. So simple stains, they can use a basic dye in a mordant to enhance the staining or enlarge the specimen, the coat of the specimen. Differential stains, they use more than one dye and it will be able it will allow you to be able to differentiate between the two types of bacteria uh, we have examples of differential stains like gram stain and acid fast stain and special stain, stains allows you to enhance structural parts like the capsule like uh, the endospore or the flagella of bacteria so gram stain was one of the first stains that was used to identify bacteria it classifies your bacteria into two groups, gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. Gram-positive bacteria, it will be a type of bacteria that tend to be killed by this antibiotic that we know as penicillin or by detergents. And gram-negative bacteria, it's a bacteria that is, for the most part, resistant to antibiotics. Now, gram-positive bacteria will stain purple it will retain a dye that is called crystal violet, and that looks purple. And gram-negative stain will stain red. This one will retain the secondary stain or counter stain that we know as safranin. Safranin looks red. So this is some of the steps of gram stain. So in gram stain, you add this dye, crystal violet, into the bacteria, and if you have a mixture of bacteria in your sample, gram positive and gram negative, in this first step, both bacteria will stain with the same dye, purple, crystal violet. Now, in the second step, you add this mordant that enhances this color, purple, and it makes crystals inside the cytoplasm of the bacteria to prevent this, in this case, crystal violet to escape from the cells. And that will be for the case of gram-positive bacteria. So when you add this mordant or iodine, both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria will still be stained purple. Now in the next step, you will have this decolorizing agent added, which is known as alcohol acetone. And or well, which is made by alcohol acetone, and then your gram-positive cells will retain the purple color while your gram-negative cells will lose this color because of this decolorizing agent. In the next step, you will add a counter stain. So you can have this colorless bacteria stain. And then this counter stain is safranin in which that bacteria that is gram-negative will pick up this dye and it will look red as opposed to purple for gram that that is the color that gram positive will retain so this is just a visualization better of the steps so here we have crystal violet you added for one minute to your sample then you rinse with water you have rinsing steps in between you rinse really quickly your sample and then you add your mordant or fix uh, fixative agent which is iodine
and you add it for one minute. You rinse, and then you add your decolorizing agent for 10 seconds, which will be acid, uh, sorry, alcohol and acetone. And then you rinse, and then you add your counter stain for one minute, which will be safrani. So if you have a mixture of bacteria, so up to this level, you won't be able to see the difference between gram positive and gram negative, and up to here as well, because if you have gram positive, gram positive will stay purple all the way, but gram negatives will be colorless at the decolorizing step. And then when you add this counter stain or secondary stains of renin, your gram negative will stain red, while the gram positive will remain purple. And this is kind of one example of how a mixture of samples will look like. So in this case, will be gram negative rods and gram positive cocky, so purple and red, meaning that you have two types of bacteria, gram positive and gram negative within the same sample. Acid fast stain is also a differential stain, but instead of using crystal violet, you will be using carbolfuxin and methylene blue. So carbolfuxin is lipid soluble dye, and this will help to stain bacteria that has this waxy coat in their cell wall. And this bacteria that has this property of picking up this carbolfuxin will won't decolorize with a decolorizer that is called acid alcohol. In this case, will be ethanol plus five percent hydrochloric acid. And then you will add a counter stain to your staining technique that is known as methylene blue. And this will help to not only stain the background, but any bacteria that didn't pick up the carbolfuxin. So acid fast, then it is used to identify bacteria like mycobacterium species or nocardia species. And acid fast microorganisms will stain red while non-acid fast will stain blue. And <clears throat> this carbolfuxin will be picked up by the cells when you actually have these cells on a glass slide and you're steaming vapor on the bottom of the glass slide. So you can open up the waxy walls so carbolfuxin can come into the cells and stain the cytoplasm of the cells red. So here we have two, two groups of bacteria, color acid fast, and color, sorry, acid fast bacteria and non acid fast bacteria. So, when you add your primary carbolfuxin stain for five minutes as you're vaporizing water under your, your slide, both acid fast and non acid fast will pick up carbolfuxin. Then you take out your sample from the vaporizing step and then you rinse, then Add the decolorizing agent, which is going to be acid alcohol, also for about 10 seconds. And then your acid fats will retain, retain the red color from carbolfuxin, while non acid fats will become colorless. And then in the last step, after you rinse, you will add canner stain, methylene blue. And since this one never released this dye from the cytoplasm, the acid fats, it will stay red. While this one, the non acid fast, which was colorless, now it's free in their cytoplasm to pick up the methylene blue and then look blue. So, non acid fast bacteria will look blue, while acid fast will look red. And then, this is how a sample of non acid fast and acid fast bacteria look like. So, this is Mycobacterium bovis. This red color represents the acid fast bacteria, while the non-acid fast will be this one in blue color. The special stains allow you to differentiate different parts of the cell. So we have capsule stain, endospore stain, which is also known as Schiffer Fulton, and flagellar stain. Negative stain, it is used to stain the capsule. So you can use India ink, and you can use uh, safranin. So here we have some bacteria that stains the cytoplasm with this counter stain or safranin, and then the outside is stained 
with this negative stain. So these are the capsules shown in this white halo or color. Capsules are basically coats of glycocalyx that prevents the bacteria from being attacked by the immune system. So this white halo will be representing the capsule and this it's a protective coat for the bacteria. So bacteria that has capsule is more dangerous. Examples of uh, bacteria that is encapsulated will be strep pneumonia, Klebsiella pneumonia, Haemophilus, Haemophilus influenza type B, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Neisseria meningitis, and Cryptococcus neoformans, which is not a bacteria, this is a fungi. Endospore staining or Schiffer Fulton uh, stains a dormant structure inside the bacteria that we know as endospores. Endospores are a resistant form of bacteria that is released into the environment when the bacteria it is found in a harsh environment. And we have the primary stain on this endospore staining that is called mal malachite green. And this one will penetrate the bacteria and it will stain the endospores. Then you will decolorize with water and then you add a counter stain, which is going to be safranin. So here we have the light microscopy view of these endospores here in green color, and the part of the bacteria that picks up the counter stain, it is known as the vegetative, vegetative form, which is staining by safranin. Two types of bacteria has endospores, Clostridia and Bacillus species. So here is the diagram to show you how the endospores look like. So this is an endospore, it's a circular resistant form of bacteria, and this will be the vegetative form. So the endospores will pick up the malachite green, and then safranin will be staining the vegetative form. Flagellar stain will stain these extensions of bacteria that bacteria uses to move around. And you have to use mordants to build up the diameter because the diameter of the flagella is very thin. So you can use uh, carbolfuxin to make visible the flagella. And here we have this example of bacteria is called Esperilon volutens. Lastly, some highlights of this chapter. So the structure and function of microorganisms has been revealed by the use of microscopes, including bite field microscope, phase contrast, fluorescence, and electron microscopes. And then the total magnification of objects is calculated by multiplying the magnification of the objective lens times the magnification of the ocular lens. In microscopes, they have a maximum resolution or resolving power that it is the ability to distinguish between two separate points. So this is all for this chapter.